Um, so my name is AJ Hale. I think I know uh, many of you have seen me before. Uh, I'm a certified cardiac device specialist based in Boston. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, and let me go ahead and make this a full screen, um, PSA and implant uh, and device-based testing for Abbott Programmer. So um, obviously it's going to be Abbott heavy just because that is what I'm trained in and that's what I know best. And this is where I pull my case examples from, but uh, I think it's important to know how to use the PSAs with everybody's device uh, because you don't know what programmer you may have uh, in a given situation. Um, so without too much further ado, I'll go ahead and get started here. So these are a number of case studies, uh, or a couple of case studies that I collected in, uh, in Haiti, actually, with Dr. Torres. I don't know if she's on the call just yet, uh, but shout out to her. Um, we were doing some implants out there at in Milo. So our first case here, we uh, hooked the patient up, we implanted the lead, and then we took a look at uh, the analyzer signal, and then this is what you have in front of you here. So the reason why I'm showing you this is I think it's really important to, to understand you know, what you're looking for when you first connect uh, to the PSA, uh, what you're looking for as far as you know, um, indications of good lead connectivity, uh, whether or not um, you know the lead is maybe in the right place where it's supposed to be, because you can't always tell fluoroscopically. Uh, it can also indicate whether or not you know um, you could have a perforation. There's certain indicators as well. So I'm allowing more people to talk here. Um, so the initial hookup here, we see our signal. We see the amplitude is 9.9 .9 millivolts at the low end, 9.5 in the low end to around 11, which is a fantastic signal. Um, generally, I, in a pacemaker, will accept anything over five or so. Um, you know, there's some flexibility. Um, and then obviously with defibrillators, you want to have a little better signal. But with pacemakers, you know, a nine or a 10 is, is, is fantastic. Um, and then obviously I hooked it up to a surface here. And reflecting on the surface, I see that the, um, you know, the QRS complex on the surface lines up with the EGM, which indicates to me that the lead is in the right place, right? And then the big thing I'm looking at here is injury current. So we've talked about current of injury before, and basically it's a localized tissue damage, um, and it kind of manifests itself as ST segment elevation or QRS widening, things like this. And usually a STEMI is, is, a, is a red flag of a, a negative thing, but in when you're actually connecting a lead with a PSA, you're looking for this injury current. That indicates that you have good tissue contact. That indicates that um, you know, you've know you done some sort of uh, damage to the tissue, and you'll actually see an association of injury current and threshold. And as injury current goes down, you'll see thresholds start to improve. improve. And that's because these modern leads are all steroid eluding. So as a steroid takes effect, you're going to see the injury come down and threshold improve as well. Sometimes sensing changes as well, but rarely um, is that the fact. So once again, good injury current, it's positive, which is fantastic. It's wide, which we love to see, and it's 50% of the amplitude. So one thing to keep in mind, if you have a very high amplitude signal, it could indicate that you, um, it could indicate that, you know, or your injury current could reflect as less than it really is. So if you have a 20 millivolt signal and the injury current is only five millivolts high, that's still a good injury current, right? That's, this is about a five millivolt injury current as well. It's, it's half of the QRS. Um, so I would, uh, I'd still accept that. We're not necessarily looking for the height of the injury, especially when you have, you know, a tall signal, you're looking for this uh, widening of the QRS or widening of the, uh, of the um, EGM QRS. So, and then we look at this blowed up version. So with the Abbott programmers, you do have a way to, to actually take a close look at the, um, the signal itself. And looking at the unfiltered signal, you have this beautiful injury current here. Um, I know I'm really driving this home, but it's so impactful when you're, when you're doing testing of, of leads. And then one thing to keep in mind is that injury current, um, you know, we always want a positive one, and I'll kind of mention that in the next slide here. So we now move to the atrium. We unhook the ventricle. So if you're looking here, your ventricular signal, there's nothing going on there anymore. You have your marker channel, you have your atrial channel, and then you have your surface up here. And those are all indicated as well to this key. So one, two, three, four. Um, so as you can see, the patient is in some sort of atrial tack, probably compensated. Uh, 
And then if you look here, there doesn't really seem to be an association between the QRS complexes and um, the P waves, which indicates to me that this is probably complete heart block. Um, these are most likely not conducting down. Uh, however, you know, there is a very narrow complex, which means that, you know, it, it's probably higher up in, um, you know, in the conduction system that has taken over from the atrium. So once again, no real association. The atrial rate is steady, the ventricular rate is steady, and they're not associated here. I would indicate complete heart block, but I would argue it's probably something like junctional as well. And then we're going to go ahead and interpret it, right? So we're looking at it and we're saying, okay, CHB uh, sensing is anywhere from three and a half to four and a half millivolts. The injury current is once again positive. It's wide. It's 90% of the sensed amplitude, but keep in mind now your injury here is not as high as your injury in the RV, right? Um, because it's a percentage of that. But once again, we're looking for, you know, um, we're looking for this widening aspect. So then I blow it up here. We're taking a look at the signal and we can see once again, it's positive. This negative deflection is just the actual, um, you know, signal itself. Um, but what we want to see is a positive injury current here, a negative injury current. So if you're ever to see it like this, that could mean two things. Well, it could mean a couple things, but it it's a red flag for possible perforation. Um, but one thing you always want to check is your alligator clip polarity, because if you switch the um, the black to the ring and have the red on the tip, it will invert your signal, which could indicate injury as well. So always make sure that it's black on the tip, uh, red on the ring for your alligator clips. Uh, that's what the physician will be holding. And then it's just plugged directly in your device. And if it's like that and it's negative, that is something you may want to suspect perforation and respond accordingly. All right. So now we've had our signal. We looked at the injury current. I'll be calling this out throughout the procedure. And any, any of you who've ever done a case with me, you know, I'm pretty vocal during a case because I like to communicate how things are looking um, and give the electrical interpretation of how things look so that the physician can keep that in mind. Um, so we're now moving on to the pacing side. So what are we looking at here um, in the marker channel? So uh, what are your marker channels here? Um, I don't know if any of you want to chime in and answer any of these questions. What is this first AR and are we capturing? Does anybody feel like chiming in? I know your chat works because you all told me my microphone wasn't working earlier. Okay. I'll go ahead and chime in then. Um, so... What are your marker channels? Once again, we have this for review here. So our first one is going to be lead one. Um, number two is going to be the markers. Number three is our atrial unfiltered signal. And then number four is the RV unfiltered signal, which is not connected. So moving on. So let's do a deep breakdown of what we're actually seeing here. So our marker channels, I already covered that. Um, not connected to the lead for that RV signal, which is why there's nothing there. You also notice far R over sensing. So what's this AR? Well, this is lining up with the QRS complex and that is indicating that, or that is just the uh, the signal of the QRS being picked up on the atrial channel. And you can actually see it as this little notch here. And because it's sent to a high sensitivity, it's picking it up. And as there's no blanking because you have no ventricular channel hooked up, the PSA is in a standard AAI mode only. It doesn't know what's happening in the RV. So as a result, any kind of signal will get flagged here. So looking at this one, you know, <clears throat> you have this QRS complex unblanked, and then you move along to um, example two, you see these P wave evoked response after every single pace. So what can I take away from this? It means that we are capturing at two volts, right? Um, we have a little bit of sensing, but that's okay because we're only in an AAI mode. So I would not be concerned by this because the device just doesn't know to blank. And we have a good signal, good indication of P wave here. All right. Unfortunately, this patient does not have good conduction. So you really can't use conducting down as an indicator. And then Jared, I saw you join. Do you have any, uh, any input for me? I know you're, I don't know if you're- Hey, AJ, hey, afternoon, yeah. everyone. Yeah, no, this is nice. It's um, it's always nice, personally, when I do an atrial threshold check, especially if someone's in heart block or it's difficult to see in one-to-one, -one, maybe they have a slow wanky back, is don't be afraid to pace the 
uh, atrium at like 120 beats per minute and even a two to one block will uh, really give you clear P waves on that ECG. So it's just a good little tip if someone is wanky backing uh, at a low rate, don't be afraid to uh, yeah crank that rate up and get two to one block as, as long as you can see P waves capturing every time and that it doesn't matter how you're doing it, um, you'll be able to see capture threshold and, and go from there. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you're modulating the the ventricular rate in any way and that rate changes, then you know that you're capturing. That's a good point. All right. Um, let's see if there's any other point I missed here. I don't think so. All right. So then we have our atrial capture test um, here. I went ahead and added this in after the fact. So uh, we were at one volt here. And then what are we seeing? So on this EGM, we have pretty much every example of, of things you'll see. And let me go ahead and fill this in here. So we have our P waves right here. You can see them across there. You can see an atrial pace with no capture here on the uh, on the atrial channel. Sorry, yeah, on the atrial channel. You can see the intrinsic breakthrough after that. And this, this telltale sign here, we can see here we atrial pace at a higher output and it is enough to evoke a response. However, it doesn't evoke a response, but it probably is as a result of functional non-capture. So it's directly following this intrinsic event. We try to pace. The atrium was probably not um, you know, able to accept it. It was still in refractory. So it functionally non-captured. And we have our intrinsic breakthrough again, but have no fear. We paced again and we do have an evoked response. Mm -hmm. So one thing I'd really like to point out here is how similar capture and non-capture look. They're almost identical. And in the atrium, it's kind of a low impact thing, right? It's really not gonna be the end of the world. However, if in ventricular events, if you're just going off morphology, you can be tricked. And I have um, heard cases of, of people who have set the device sub-threshold and just thought they were capturing and the patient was um, not in a good state. So always make sure that you're capturing. Don't always trust morphology. Um, because that this is case in point, right? Um, so then we have R wave over sensing. Once again, we're an AAI, so I'm not really worried about it, but it's just another example of that. And then we have continued capture. Anything for me there, Jared? No, that's spot on, mate. I think you really hit home the point. It's the importance of just really having an ECG when you are doing a pacing check because uh, you can be fooled if you're just going to look at the, uh, the atrial or the ventricle uh, intracardiac EGM. So it's really important that you line up those intracardiac EGMs with a P wave or a QRS on the ECG. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, I, I think that's dead on. I think you mentioned too, it, you know, anytime you're checking your device. So obviously this is in, um, you know, it, during an implant. But as Jared said, anytime you're checking a device, if you're not at all sure, you know, the EKG is your friend. And a lot of times it can save you a lot of heartache down the road. Um, no pun intended. Uh, by being able to see what's actually happening. So, all right, moving along to our second case here. All right, so we have an atrial and ventricular sensing test uh, on the PSA. Here again, we're looking at injury current. We have a good injury current here. It lines with the atrial event here. Beautiful QRS. We have our ventricular. Once again, we have a great injury current. Sensing wasn't quite as good as it was before, but we're still, we still have decent sensing for, um, for the RV. The sensing is great in the RA. You have good injury current on both. It's positive for both. Um, just, you know, I'll, I'll always remember, look for the positivity. If you have a negative injury current, check your polarity. <clears throat> and if the polarity is fine, then you should possibly suspect perforation. We're gonna to go to our capture test here. So what are our clues that could indicate capture here? Um, I mean, you kind of talked through it a little bit. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in, Jared, but. Um, but just for, okay, from my perspective, you know, what are, what are my clues that I'm capturing? Well, one, I see um, a evoked response on the EKG <clears throat> aligning with the atrial pace. Morphologically, it's a little different. It's a little more flat than the intrinsic, and that's just because you're pacing from a different spot in the atrium. Um, you can see that you pace, and then there's no associated QRS complex. That is also a strong indication that you've lost capture, right? You have one-to-one -one here, pace, QRS, pace, QRS, pace, 
nothing happens. And then you have the intrinsic breakthrough here. And then you have your uh, QRS as well. <clears throat> um, we continue here, no capture intrinsic. And then when it goes to five volts, um, we get back to this pattern. I wouldn't, this one, you know, obviously is not going to conduct down because it's so close to the QRS complex. And then this one obviously does capture and conduct across. So those are my indicators. I don't know if you have any points on that, Jared. No, that's perfect. Um, I mean, where possible, I always try and do my actual threshold in AAI, where possible, if someone's got intact AV conduction, because then really all you're relying on then is just that rate change on your ECG. And you, if you lose that one-to-one -one capture and you get that nice kind of almost like a pause there in, in between that 0.7 volts, um, it's a really nice indicator that you've lost capture. So you can do it in DDD, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it could be just that a little bit harder to maybe pick up that P wave. That's a good point. And I, I think the one thing, just obviously, if they don't have good conduction, everyone don't use AI. Um, if they have, you know, you can always do DDD or DDI with long AV delays. Uh, but to Jared's point, if they have very long conduction, you're not going to see it. It's the device is going to pace too early uh, before the intrinsic comes across. So as long as they have good conduction, I, I totally agree. I feel safe to do AI. Um, but for people who are less experienced, you know, maybe do DDD until you get more confident with, with devices would be my only argument. All right. So then we're looking here at deep dive on the atrial capture test. What are we seeing? Once again, clear one-to-one. -one. This is a helpful indicator capture. Um, morphologically similar uh, capture versus non-capture. So once again, we didn't capture here and we did here. I mean, you could argue this is, you know, well, you don't have to argue. It's clearly, it's a little bit uh, different morphology, but very, very similar. So if you're just going off of, you know, looking at the spike, you'll be tricked. So always make sure to look for other indicators because I've seen it where, pe where people have set thresholds much lower and set output sub-threshold as a result. So um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to note too, and this is a little trick I learned from a doctor um, up in New Hampshire is, you know, you know, obviously impedance is a good indicator of, of lead placement and you were looking for it to be within range of, of less, you know, of greater than 200 ohms, um, less than 2000 ohms. I think, okay, I did have that right. Um, and if you're obviously outside of those, then you might suspect, are you co properly connected to the lead first before you suspect anything else? So if your impedance is saying less than 200 ohms, those little alligator clips have little rubber covers because those have come off and the alligator clip metal is touching. That is creating a short circuit, which is um, going to have lower impedance. If it's greater than 2000, well, are you properly placed on the um, on the electrodes on the lead itself? If you're not properly seated there, that can have greater than 2000 ohms as well. And then finally, um, one thing I like to check, especially if you're at all sent, you know, worried about perf, but I almost do it every single time is check <clears throat> the bipolar impedance versus unipolar impedance. So at your bipole, when you, you should have a, you know, within range impedance, and then you say, okay, why don't we go ahead and take that red, um, alligator clip and either connect it to skin or connect it to something within that's touching the pocket, right? And create a unipolar signal essentially. And if your unipolar impedance is greater than your bipole, um, then you should possibly suspect perforation. And the reason being, if you think about it, your bipolar is you have your tip and your ring electrode, your unipolar is just the tip electrode. And if it's outside of the heart, you can have a higher impedance because you're now kind of in air as opposed to in the tissue itself. So if you check your unipolar, so just from the tip to the can, and it shows as a higher impedance, um, then you might want to suspect possible perforation. So just things to keep in mind. All right. Oh, Jared, do you have anything for me? Sorry. No, you're cool, man. That, that's, that's perfect. I do that exact same trick for... Um... If there's ever in doubt of perforation, you do it for the pacing as well. You, but sometimes if you're perforating your pacing bipolar, you've still got enough of that because the, the bipolar electrode is so close together, you can still capture myocardium. But mm -hmm. if you pace tip to can and that, that tip is outside of the heart, then the chances are you won't capture. So that's really a nice way of uh, determining mm -hmm. if you have perforated as well. I like that. I've never, I've not actually heard that one before. So that's, that's good. Yeah. So also try pacing. Um, is a good way of doing it. Yeah, because yeah, I think you can have some degree of anodal stem as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which, when you're on bipolar, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. So we, we talked about anodal stem in the past, but for those who don't know, it's basically where you capture at your anode instead of just at your cathode. And what can happen is you have polarization building up on your anode, which happens to be the ring, which could be touching the myocardium at that point, depending how deep you are. Right. Um, so if you're capturing bipole, you know, that might not be truly you know, you're not maybe necessarily capturing the tip. So if you go to Unipolar and you're no longer capturing, as as Jared said, suspect possible perf. That's cool. I've never I never heard that one. So that's that's good to know. All right. So uh, I just kind of wanted to visual you give this as a visualization because I think a lot of times, especially when I first started out, I'd get a threshold and I would I would not love it. And I say, and I'd suspect like maybe we should move it, right? And I think the biggest thing is just being patient um, because with these steroid eluding leads, you know, thresholds tend to drop over time if you have a good injury current. Uh, once again, you don't base your injury current on a pace. Uh, really, it's not the best. You want to look at the sensed injury current. Here you have that sensed one. This is the injury I showed you earlier, right? We ran our threshold. We decrement down. We have this one-to-one -one conduction, and then we have a pace. We have um, no real evoked response on the EKG, and we also uh, don't have a conduction of the QRS complex, which indicates loss of capture. And then you have this breakthrough of intrinsic, once again, indicates that we lost capture. And I say, oh, 2.7, that's not great. In atrium, especially, I tend to see higher um I, I tend to see higher thresholds when you really screw in there with an active lead and they get better over time. So we just said, okay, we'll let it simmer for a little bit, right? So we waited another five minutes post implants and check the threshold again. And right here we see we lose capture at 2.1 volts. We gave it another five minutes, so 10 minutes total, and the threshold's down to 0.7. So if we had moved that lead, we could have you know, increased the risk of perf. We would have drugged this case out possibly even longer right? Because 10 minutes wait, you can go and work on other things. You don't have to just sit there and not do anything waiting to test. So we can go work on tying the ventricular lead down while we wait for the atrial lead, or you can work on cleaning up the pocket and just work our way back to it. Um, so it's just a way just to, to really drive home the like you can be patient and generally things get better as long as you have good injury current. If you have bad injury current, if it's negative, any number of factors we've already talked about, then that's a different conversation altogether. Got anything for me there? No, man, that's spot on. It's it's funny. I, I see exactly the same thing. RA threshold always starts high and comes down. And I've never, well, actually, if there's any doctors on here that can explain the theory behind that, I'm not sure the pathology behind it, but it must be something about atrial tissue, but just it seems to get better with time. But uh, you don't see it so much in the ventricle. Usually the ventricle is pretty good from the get-go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, I see the same phenomenon all the time with the atrial lead. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wish I knew. I, I once had somebody tell me it's just thinner tissue, but I think that might have just been the easiest answer that came to their mind. So that's I we'll have to we'll have to follow up on that. But yeah, glad to see I'm not crazy. I'm All right. Not. <laughs> we're moving, at least not in this case. Uh, so then we move to the ventricular capture test. So now we're on the device, um, no longer on the pulse sense analyzer. Um, we do our Capture, work our way down, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, loss of capture. Um, you see this evoked or this uh, intrinsic break away. So that indicates that we've we've truly lost, right? We're looking at that one-to-one. -one. Obviously, you should have a surface electrode. We don't in this case. Um, so going back over it again, use VVI. And then one thing I like to do whenever I'm doing a VVI test is look for retrograde while I'm doing it, right? So do we have retrograde conduction? At least not in this case, right? Because we would expect to see atrial events one-to-one -one lining up with ventricular events. And instead, there is no association between A's and V's. That indicates that there's no uh, retrograde conduction at all. I don't know if you got anything for me there on that one, Jared. No, man, I was going to, you took the words out of my mouth. It's, um, it's a real, it's a two for one that you, uh, you get a threshold check and you can also see if there's VA conduction and, and, um, VA conduction is so important when you're trying to diagnose, uh, whether something's an atrial tachy, a VT or an SVT and uh, knowing whether the patient has VA conduction is very important. 100%. Diagnostic so, sense. Yeah. And it, it makes a difference in your programming as well of your PVARP, right? So if you see yeah. retrograde, um, what you can do on the Abbott programmers, I don't know about, I'm sure the other programmers have something you can do a little freeze frame, get the little camera icon in the top right corner of it, camera icon next to an EGM, um, click there, it'll freeze it. And then you can actually 
apply calipers and see what your V to A timing is at a certain rate. Remember, it's rate dependent. So um, if you do have VA retrograde conduction, then you want to go ahead and run it at, say, 100 up to 120 or so, just to see what the longest conduction time is, and then make sure your shortest PVARP exceeds that. Um, in some cases, it's super long, and there's some programming you're going to have to do, or maybe just go DDIR for the rest of their life. Um, but generally, it's it's something you can program around, and it's a way to you know, get this test done early and just make it part of your routine. Okay. So we got our atrial capture test. Um, ignore the fact that it says capture lost right here. It actually lost right here. Um, I just didn't click in the right area when I when I screenshotted this to use. But um, once again, we're using our same indicators that we used on the um, on the device. And take a closer look at it here. Once again, capture lost. One thing to keep in mind um, <clears throat> is that you know, we're no longer seeing this uh, QRS complex show up um, as an AR like we did in the previous test because now PVAB is in place. So when the ventricular event occurs, the device knows to blank it out because it has an idea of what's happening in the ventricle. So that is the advantage of, of not running um, AI if you're worried about whether or not PVAB is, close, is covering it up. Uh, once again, use long AV delays to promote intrinsic conduction. You need to have at least 350 in this case, I would say, just to make sure it comes across. Um, and then, you know, obviously, I just want to show your loss of capture there. I think that's really, you know, um, that's really all we were trying to to really touch on today. I don't know if there's a whole bunch more you want to you want to talk about, uh, Jared, at all. It's a pretty quick, easy session, though. No, man, that's what's been really good. Um, I think it's, it's although it may come across as short and sharp tonight, it's, there's some really important take-home messages there for implanting, you know, whether it's about action potentials and um, injury current, sorry, um, how you're programming, ensuring you've got optimal programming, a little bit of troubleshooting there with um, knowing if you're perforated or not. So, and uh, yeah, different types of programming you can do when you're trying to check a threshold. So, no, very effective. Yeah, appreciate it. So there will be, um, I'll be recording some in the next two weeks because I'll be in the field. Um, so I will get some video of actual PSA tests and we will post that on YouTube as well. So you can kind of see the process with us clicking the buttons on the programmer. But if you have specific questions, because we'll be in the field, we'll be collecting video, please reach out to us in the WhatsApp group or you know comment on YouTube or wherever you want to do it, just so it gets back to us um, and we know what to collect for you so we can... We can help best. Um, any good questions from the group at all? I really appreciate you joining there, Jared. That was really, really helpful input. If not, then I will say everyone go enjoy your Sunday and happy St. Patrick's Day for those who celebrate. Uh, good night, everyone. Thanks, Aja. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night.